say that some of you just came out of a life group where you're doing the sermon-based discussion guide. Well, I'm going to start leading one of those groups this Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to be following that same guide. And some of you may be thinking or asking, well, well, why are we doing only that? Why aren't we offering a lot of other Bible studies? Well, part of the reason is because so many are doing things on their own outside of church. you got your Bible app, and you're connected to people and doing a lot of different sort of things. And so I'm kind of in the middle of an experiment here. I want to see what might happen among us if we just took the text of God's Word that we're looking at as a family every Sunday and had a conversation on that again during the week with another group of people or maybe two more conversations with an additional group of people. Some of you are even gluttons for punishment. You're going in for three, but I just think there may be some significant value in going deeper on one thing than going wider on a whole bunch of things. And so this Wednesday, I get to step into the laboratory. I've been writing this stuff, but I haven't gotten to be in one of those groups. So I get to step into the laboratory this Wednesday at nine o'clock with some of y'all and get to see how that's kind of going for myself. All right, well, hey, glad that you guys are here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're gonna jump in today to Matthew chapter four. God, we are grateful to be in this place, and we do declare glory to your name, in your name alone. God, we tremble at the idea that any name in here or any name on the building, God, would get glory today. God, to your name alone be all the glory. And Holy Spirit, we pray that today you would be magnified not only here but in faraway places. We pray for Madison today, one of our own, far from here, sharing the gospel with those who've yet to hear the name of Jesus. We pray for our ladies who are serving, God, in Belize right now, meeting medical, physical needs, as well as spiritual. We pray for Pastor Johnny as he's getting ready to go to Tanzania this week. We pray for mission opportunities right here at home, like save a life. And God, for us right here in this room, we, we need to hear from you today out of your word. So Holy Spirit, would you be our teacher? And would you give us ears to hear the truth? And would you give us hearts and grace to respond rightly to you, our God, today, to the glory of your name? We ask it. And all God's people said, amen. Matthew 4 is where we are, and we're preaching a sermon series called Different, where we're just walking through the gospel of Matthew, word by word, line by line. Um, I, I tell you what, I'm preaching out of the CSB for this particular journey. So if you're looking to pick up a new Bible as we walk through Matthew, if you want to grab a CSB, that's fine. I'm not completely connected to CSB. I'll probably bounce a little bit, but that's kind of mainly where I'm tracking right there. And so by the time we're through this study, your pages in the book of Matthew will probably be all marked up. So I encourage you maybe to consider doing that. Now listen, if you're a big picture person like I am, like I'm, I'm not really in the details of stuff a whole lot. You know, there's the things you got to do. Obviously, we all have to be in the details, but just by nature, I'm a big picture sort of guy. And if you kind of lean in that direction with me today, you're sort of a big picture sort of person, then I think you're really going to dig these verses out of Matthew chapter 4 today because that's what really Matthew's doing here is he's giving us the big picture of what's going to be happening throughout the book of Matthew. Let me explain. So far in our study through Matthew, Matthew 1, 2, and 3, and halfway through chapter 4, Matthew's been presenting all this information in a, in a pretty chronological, sequential sort of way. Well, all that ends today. Unlike some of the other gospel accounts who are very chronological and sequential, Matthew's not going to do that. Instead, he is going to begin to develop a pattern. And I want to show you this so when we go through Matthew, you'll, you'll kind of understand what he's doing. He begins today to break away from chronology, and he begins to develop a pattern. And the pattern is this. Jesus teaches and preaches, and then Jesus displays his power in a lot of different sort of ways. And then Jesus teaches and preaches, and then he displays his power in a bunch of sort of ways. And then Jesus teaches and preaches, and then he displays his power in all kinds of ways. So you'll see that pattern develop as we walk through Matthew's gospel together. But before he gets into that pattern, he uses the verses that we're going to be looking at today to sort of give us an overview of what's coming for the rest of the book, right? Big picture stuff here today. So kind of think of these verses we're going to look at today like the movie preview of the greatest blockbuster movie of all time, the life and the ministry of Jesus. So let's go to the Word, and we're going to today identify six major themes that are going to jump off the pages of Scripture through Matthew's Gospel 
over and over and over again throughout this journey. So class, if you have your pen and paper, you wanna go ahead and number your paper one to six today, and we're gonna identify these six major themes that we're gonna see. Now let's back up to the last verse where we were last week, Matthew chapter four, verse 11. Jesus had just went toe to toe with Satan in the wilderness, facing those temptations, and had come out victorious. And verse 11 said, then the devil left him, and the angels came, and began to serve him. Now, before we go to verse 12, I just wanna say this to you. Between 11 and 12, those verses, there's about a year's worth of information that's missing there. Matthew just kind of fast forwards over about a year of the ministry of Jesus. He skips a lot of things. He skips, for example, Jesus' first encounter with his 12 disciples. He skips over Jesus' first miracle, which was the turning of the water into wine at that wedding in Cana, right? He skips over the first time Jesus ran the money changers out of the temple, skips completely over that. He skips over Jesus' conversation uh, with Nicodemus. John gives us that one in John chapter three. John also gives us the information in John four about the Samaritan woman at the well, but but Matthew doesn't put that in his story, and he doesn't tell us about how Jesus was ran out of his hometown of Nazareth. So if you're trying to pinpoint, when we get to Matthew chapter four, verse 12, where are we on the timeline of Jesus's life and ministry? Well, we're, we're at about the, the second year of the three and a half years that he's gonna be ministering here on the earth. So now, let's look at the big picture Matthew wants us to see today, those six big themes. Verse 12, and when he heard that John, that's Jesus, when Jesus heard that John, the Baptist, the baptizer, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Now this is not shocking because John the Baptist had been saying all along, I must decrease so that he may increase. And so this arrest of and imprisonment of John the Baptist signals that that's now happening in full, that John is stepping way back. He's really decreasing, and Jesus is really increasing now front and center on the stage. And I wanna say this, that when Jesus, after John's arrest, goes to Galilee, he's not running from Herod. You need to understand the region there around Galilee was the heart of Herod's rule and his control. So Jesus isn't backing up to avoid resistance. Jesus is marching right into the heart of resistance when he goes to that region. And the majority of his ministry is gonna be there. The majority of his miracles are gonna happen there. He has chosen that this is gonna be the headquarters. This is gonna be the hub for my life, for my ministry. And beginning in verse 13, we start to pick up on those six themes. The first one is this. Jesus' ministry, all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, his ministry is about connection. Jesus' ministry is about connection. And, And let me explain what I mean by that. And we've already seen this if you've been here with Matthew. He loves to do this. He loves to grab the Old Testament and he loves to connect it to Jesus. Jesus is gonna do that all through the Gospel of Matthew, because his ministry is a ministry of connection. He's connecting the Old Testament prophecies to himself to say, I am the promised Messiah. He is the fulfillment of everything that had been proclaimed. He has this ministry of connection. Let's look at verse 13. He left Nazareth. He actually got ran out of Nazareth. They tried to push him off a cliff. And he went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, And Matthew says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Ministry of connection, right? Matthew just grabbed the Old Testament. He said Jesus did that because it's fulfillment of what was said in the Old Testament. And then he quotes Isaiah the prophet. He says, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. What in the world is all that about? What is Zebulun and Naphtali? This is Matthew doing what he's done, what he's gonna do so many times, grabbing the old, connecting it to Jesus. Matthew's repeatedly making these connections because he's Jewish, he's got Jewish friends, he's got Jewish family, and he wants them to know the promised Messiah, he's come. And his name is Jesus. He wants them to see that and to see that clearly. So what exactly is the connection here? What what does Zebulun and Naphtali 
have to do with anything? Well, I'm really glad you asked, so let's talk about that. Matthew says that when Jesus left his hometown, he went up to Capernaum, and he lived in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And that's weird. It's weird that Matthew would say that. It's weird because those areas, those regions, had not been called by those names in 700 years. Nobody called those places Zebulun and Naphtali when Matthew was around, when Jesus went to headquarter his ministries there. You know, over, over time, things have a way of sort of changing. Sometimes the names of places sort of change. For example, on our commute from here to where we live in Tuscaloosa, there's been some changes happening. Exit 100, my whole life, I grew up off exit 97. So my whole life, man, I'm passing by exit 100, and my whole life, those exit signs there at exit 100 have said the same thing. You know what they say? They used to say, Abernat and Bucksville, all right? They don't say that anymore. Now they say, Lakeview. How many of you from Lakeview today? Bunch of y'all. Lakeview, you got a new name. <laughs> Written down in glory, or, or on the interstate sign at least, all right? Al Dots hooks you up, got a new name. Well, these names, Zebulon and Naphtali, those names had come off the signs about 700 years earlier. And Matthew says in verse 14 that that's where Jesus went to live in that region. It's the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, up in the northern part of, of Israel. And, and he quotes what Isaiah had said 700 years before in verse 15. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Gentile simply means non-Jew. This is another hint for Matthew reminding his Jewish readers of this. It's not all about y'all. It's not all about us Jewish folks. He, he, over and over again, is gonna point out to his Jewish people that Jesus came for all people. That's why he included Gentiles in the genealogy of Jesus. That's why he included Gentile wise men in that story he gave about the wise men coming to see Jesus. So where is, or what is Zebulun and Naphtali? What's that about? Okay, so Zebulun and Naphtali were two of this Old Testament dudes named Jacob, two of his 12 sons. And if you were here last year and I was preaching through the life of Joseph, you may remember as we were preaching through that, I had to clean it up, had to edit it, because that's one of those sections in the Bible that's kind of R-rated. It's rough. Jacob was a mess, and his sons were big messes. They did terrible, horrible things. Among the horrible things they did is they took their younger brother Joseph, threw him in a pit, and then they sold him as a slave, lied to their father for decades about it, saying that, that he was dead, and that's pretty bad. And the Bible tells us that when Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to find food, and that's how they discovered where Joseph was, really, if you remember that story, the Bible says those 12 brothers, when they came, brother number six in the list was Zebulun, brother number nine in the list was Naphtali. That's the backstory on who these guys are. Now, fast forward 500 years. After Joseph, God's people end up being put into slavery in, in Egypt, right? And then God raises up Moses. He brings them out of slavery. They wander in the wilderness 40 years. Joshua brings them across the Jordan River. They finally get into the land that God had promised Abraham so long ago. And when they get into the land, they begin to conquer. And then they begin to divide the land up among the 12 territories, the, the, the 12 tribes into territories. And so the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, they were given this big chunk of region, really nice area, up there on the northwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee. Now fast forward another 700 years. The kingdom of Israel's fighting with themselves, like families do sometimes, right? The fighting got so bad that the kingdom split. Some of the kids in the room remember the Bible timeline, the kingdom split. And the kingdom in the north was known as the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom in the south, Kingdom of Judah. Kingdom of Judah had two tribes. Kingdom of Israel had 10 tribes. Capital city in the kingdom of Israel was the city of Samaria. Capital city in the kingdom of Judah down south is the kingdom of, uh, is the capital of Jerusalem. Now fast forward another 200 years. You hanging with me? After this split lasts for 200 years, there's this world empire known as the Assyrians. The Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom of Israel and they attacked the capital there of Samaria. And their M.O., the Assyrians' M.O. was this. They deport out the people who lived there. They deported in people who had previously not lived there. And they tried to breed the Jewish people to extinction. That's really what 
they were after here. And that new race of people that emerged in all of that became known as the Samaritans. And that area around Galilee was heavily populated with these Samaritan people. And the people down in the south in Judah, they, did, they had nothing for the Samaritans. They, they looked down on them with great disdain. They were people that, as far as they were considered, that, that ethnically they were mixed, politically they were mixed, religiously they were mixed. And they looked down on them like a bunch of dogs. Well, why am I telling you this? I'm boring you with all this history, but why? Why? Because you need to know this. The first two tribes that Assyria deported out, Zebulun and Naphtali. They were the first two to go, and they were the two that had been gone the longest. Isaiah the prophet that Matthew's already referred to, he was living during that time, and he says this in Isaiah chapter eight, verse 22. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. Listen, if that was you and you lived in Zebulon and Naphtali, this was the worst of times for you. Thick, thick darkness, distress, affliction. The people in Zebulon and Naphtali, they had been in that place longer than anybody. First to get to that dark place, they had been there the longest of anybody. But in chapter nine of Isaiah, the very next chapter, he says this. The people who live in darkness, Zebulon, Naphtali, have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Well, nobody knew what he meant when he wrote that in Isaiah chapter nine. But 700 years later, Matthew grabs that and Matthew repeats those very same words. What's he saying? Matthew's saying, Jesus is that light that has come to their darkness, to their distress. In fact, if you read that verse again, Matthew 4, 16, let's read it like this. The people who live in darkness have seen Jesus. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, Jesus has dawned. And that brings me to the second theme that I wanna make sure you get today is this. Not only was Jesus' ministry a ministry of connection, but it's a ministry of compassion, a ministry of compassion. The people around Galilee had been in this dark place this distressful place, the valley of the shadow of death for so long, but now what's happened? Jesus, the light of the world has come and he's made his home right there. Why? Because he's compassionate. He's full of compassion. People probably question Jesus. Jesus, what in the world are you thinking? I mean, you're gonna be this rising star of a rabbi and you're going to the Galilee of the Gentiles. That's where you're gonna headquarter yourself right there. That's crazy. Well, what's Matthew doing? Matthew's showing us that Jesus, his ministry is about compassion. In compassion, he's offering himself to those who are the first to be displaced. In compassion, he's offering himself to those who had been in the darkness longer than anybody. Remember, this is Matthew giving us the big picture of what Jesus is all about, and he's gonna show us this over and over again, that in compassion, Jesus steps into the dark places, that Jesus is a compassionate Messiah. He goes to the least. He goes to the last. This is Jesus. He goes to the hurting. This is hitting some hearts in this room. He goes to the hopeless. He goes to the broken. He goes to the lost. He goes to those who've lost hope. To the ones who've been overcome by darkness and by grief. And to such as these, Jesus says, I'm coming to your neighborhood and I'm gonna walk your streets, and I'm gonna shop in your stores, and I'm gonna eat in your homes, and I'm gonna sit around your fire pits. That's Jesus. His is a ministry of connection and compassion. Third, his is a ministry of salvation. It's a ministry of salvation. Listen, if you know the history of that northern kingdom there, then you know this, when the Assyrians came and attacked them, this wasn't a bunch of 
innocent people being victimized. This wasn't a bunch of pure and holy people getting a beat down from the Assyrians. That's not the case at all. The people in the northern kingdom, Zebulon, Naphtali, and others, they had repeatedly rebelled against God. They had repeatedly resisted God. They had repeatedly lived as if God did not exist. They had turned to other religions. They had worshiped other gods. In fact, they harassed God's prophets. They even killed God's prophets. They ignored God's word. They lived in appalling ways. And they acted in atrocious ways. And God said to those people in Jeremiah chapter two, he said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the source of living water, and they've dug for themselves wells that are broken and can't hold any water. And what did God do with those people, Zebulon and Naphtali? What did he do when he had exhausted all options to turn their hearts toward him? He rose up the Assyrians. He used them to bring judgment upon those people, but not because God was done with them. Not because God was casting them off. This is tough love from a compassionate Jesus, from a compassionate God. His will was not to reject them. His will was not to crush them. But his will was still to save them, to rescue them. Why? Because the ministry of Jesus is a ministry of salvation. He is seeking to save that which is lost. That's why. This is why Matthew points this out. This is why Jesus made his headquarters there, in that place. Because he was going to the worst of the worst, the most vile of the vile. Why? Because God doesn't just run to the broken. God doesn't just run to the hurting. God doesn't just run to the ones who have been victimized. He also runs to the ones who have done awful things. He runs to sinners who are guilty of the worst offenses. And Matthew shows us that over and over again, that Jesus' ministry isn't just compassionate for the hurting, but it is salvation for the vilest of sinners. Jesus comes offering salvation to those who are living under judgment, those who are living under guilt, those who are living under shame, those who are living under condemnation. And Jesus says, I've not come to condemn but I've come that you might be saved. Jesus comes to those that others say they're a lost cause. Jesus comes for those that others say they're too far gone. Jesus comes to those whose reputations are stained and marred with sin. And to such as those, Jesus says, I'm coming to your neighborhood. And I'm walking your street. And I'm shopping in your stores. And I'm going to sit in your homes. And I'm going to sit around your fire pits. What are we saying? This is what the whole story is about. Jesus' ministry is about connection. It's about compassion. It's about salvation, number four. Jesus' ministry is about restoration. His ministry is about restoration. I told you that nobody had called Zebulun and Naphtali, those names, for 700 years. And that reminds us that whatever has been lost, Jesus comes to restore it. Jesus comes to redeem it. He's restoring what has been lost and displaced. He's restoring people of all races from all places That's what Jesus does. By the way, that's what Jesus is still doing. And maybe you're here today and you've lost something. Maybe you've lost a relationship. Maybe you're here today and you've lost your way. Maybe you're here today and you've lost hope. It's possible you're here today and you've lost the will to go on. Jesus has come to restore what's been lost. He runs to the dark places. He runs to the hard places, the places where people are broken, 
and lost and hurting. He runs to the places where people are defeated and forgotten and rejected. And he says to people like that, I'm coming to your neighborhood. I'm walking your streets. And I'm going to shop in your stores. And I'm going to eat in your house. And I'm going to sit around your fire pit. What are we saying? Jesus' ministry, this is it. This is what he's like. It's about connection. It's about compassion. It's about salvation. It's about restoration. Number five, Jesus' ministry is about invasion. Invasion. Look at verse 17. Matthew says, from then on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Listen, we've heard that sermon before. One chapter over, that's what John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. But this time it's different. Because the preaching of the kingdom isn't just the message of Jesus' message, not just the theme of his message, but the kingdom is present in the person who's preaching it. Jesus the king is present and visible there in a man, Jesus the Christ, God made flesh. And Matthew tells us in verse 17 that Jesus has begun his invasion, his kingdom invasion. The kingdom of heaven is invading the kingdom of darkness. And by the way, Matthew loves this theme of kingdom, loves it. You're going to see that over and over again in Matthew's gospel. 55 more times we're going to hear the word kingdom. It's a big topic for Matthew, and we're not going to be able to unpack all of that today, but I do want to give you three things to think about as we talk about the kingdom today. Here's the first thing I want you to know. When we're thinking about the kingdom, I want you to think power over place. Think power over over place. And Matthew's going to point us to that over and over again. Over and over again, he's going to show us the power of Jesus. He's going to show us, show us the rule of Jesus, the reign of Jesus, the dominion of Jesus, the authority of Jesus over laws of nature. We're, we're going to see it over diseases. We're going to see it over demons. Praise the Lord. We're even going to see it over death itself. And every time Matthew shows us one of those moments, he's reminding us of the kingdom. And he's reminding us, don't think of place, think of power. Think of power. The kingdom of heaven is invading the earth. Look at what he says, Matthew 4, verse 23. Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the peoples. Just pause a minute. Verse 23 is Matthew saying, here's the pattern you're gonna see all throughout the book. Jesus preaches and teaches, and then he heals every disease and sickness among the people. He's gonna do that over and over again. Preach and teach, and then display his power. Preach and teach, and display his power. Verse 24, then the news about him spread throughout Syria, so they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics, and he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Listen, when you hear the kingdom of heaven, I don't want you just to think place. I want you to think power. Think power over place. Because when we pray, he's going to teach us to pray in a couple of chapters, your kingdom come. When we pray that, we're not praying, God, drop a castle out of heaven and landed on some geographical place here on the earth. No, when we talk about his kingdom coming, we're talking about we want your power to come, your rule to come, your reign to come, your dominion to come, your authority to come here in this place, just as it is in heaven. May it be fully manifested here. And those verses that we just read about where Matthew says he was doing all these things and all these things and all these things. By the way, that's just an appetizer, y'all, to what life in the kingdom looks like, to what it is now and what it will be. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we aren't talking merely about a place. We're talking about the power, dominion, the rule, and the reign of God himself in the world. It's important that I show you that because our human nature is that we are easily uh, kind of misconstruing what the truth is of the kingdom. Jesus' own people in the first century, they did that. They thought, it's a place, and the Messiah is going to come, he's going to kick out Rome, and he's going to establish his place and his kingdom here. That's why on Palm Sunday, they're worshiping Jesus as the Messiah. Hosanna, Hosanna, right? But by Friday, they're calling for him to be murdered because they're realizing he's not bringing an army. 
He's not running Rome out on a rail. He's not doing what we supposed that he was gonna do. They had misconstrued the idea of the kingdom of heaven. They did that in the first century, and we in the 21st century, we have, at our peril, developed sometimes, I think, only futuristic ideas about the kingdom of heaven. We think that it's coming one day in the sweet by and by when I fly away. But that's not true either. And that brings me to the second thing I wanna tell you about the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think present, not just future. Think present, not just future. Let me show you what Luke says here. Luke 17, verse 20. Luke says, when he, that's Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, see here or there. And then Jesus says, for you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, don't, don't think place, think power. Don't just think future, but think present. Now, is it coming in its fullness one day? Absolutely. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And we look forward to that day, but I'm telling you, that day is also already come. The kingdom isn't just future, it's also present. Listen to what Paul says, Colossians chapter one, verse 13. He has rescued us. It doesn't say will rescue us, see that? He has rescued us from what? From the domain or the kingdom of darkness. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Listen, if you put your faith in Christ, you're a new creature today. Old things have passed away. Your citizenship has been moved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of light. And the king is saying to you today, I'm coming to your neighborhood. And I'm gonna walk your streets today. And I'm gonna shop in your stores with you. And I'm gonna eat in your homes. And I'm gonna sit with you around the fire pit. But the most important truth I can tell you today about the kingdom of heaven is this. The kingdom of heaven is only entered one way. Jesus says in John 14, I am the way. There's only one way to God. His name's Jesus. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets into the kingdom except by me. Well, if Jesus is the way, then what does that mean for us? Jesus just told us. He just told us. Matthew 4, 17, he said, repent. Repent. Turn your mind. Turn your mind from life your way on your terms. Turn your life from your sin. Turn your life from yourself and turn to Jesus in faith. Believing, trusting in him. And by the way, we don't turn to Jesus because one day we suddenly wake up and go, my gosh, I'm a horrible person. My gosh, my life is falling apart. I'm so bad, I'm so wicked, I need Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. Paul says, you know why we repent? He said, it's not the badness of God that leads us to repentance, it's the goodness of God. Not the badness of man that leads to repentance, it's the goodness of God. The Holy Spirit wakes us up to realize there is none like Jesus. There is none with might like he has. There is none with mercy like he has. There is none with grace like he has. There is none with beauty like he has. There is none like him. And our hearts turn because there is no treasure to be found anywhere else like him. And we turn and we repent of trusting and treasuring other things supremely and we turn and we repent and we trust and treasure him supremely instead. The challenge with that is that so many of us today in our world, we're believing all these lies about God. We don't believe that he is good and mighty and full of grace and mercy and beauty. We don't believe that. We've been buying the lies that we talked about last Sunday, that he is a God that does not care. He is a God that does not love. He is a God who has a plan for me that is not good. See, the problem is people are believing in a God that doesn't exist. They're not believing the God of the Bible. What most people believe about God is not the God of the Bible. 
When we take these lies that we believe about God and we couple them together with our own selfish nature to desire self-control and self-autonomy and it's my way or it's the highway, then instead of repenting to Jesus, we're rebelling further away from Jesus. But the fact is, the God of the Bible is not like so many think he is. You wanna know what God's like, really like? Watch Jesus. You wanna know what his kingdom is really like? Walk with me over these weeks and months and let's watch the ministry of Jesus unfold. That's what his kingdom looks like. The invasion of the kingdom of God brings joy, not sorrow. The kingdom of heaven, when it invades your life, it brings life, not death. Light, not darkness. Freedom, not bondage. All that is ours if we would simply see the goodness, the greatness of God and turn and trust, believe him. There's only one way to be in that kingdom and that's to turn to the king. What's Matthew telling us? Matthew's saying today, hey, buckle up. Because when we turn this page to Matthew chapter five, you're going on a journey. And Jesus is gonna teach and preach and then he's gonna do. And he's gonna teach and preach and he's gonna do. And through those patterns, what you're gonna see is that Jesus' is, Jesus is ministry is a ministry of connection. And it's a ministry of compassion. And it's a ministry of salvation. And it's a ministry of restoration. And it's a ministry of invasion. Sixth and last. Jesus' ministry is a ministry of invitation. Of invitation. Look at verse 18. I love this. Love it, love it, love it. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee through Old Zebulun and Naphtali, he saw two brothers. Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea because they're fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people immediately. No, I would pray about it. That's the biggest Jesus cop out in the world. Well, we know it's the right thing, right? Immediately, the Bible says they left their nets. And they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father. And they followed him. Jesus invited these men and they gave him their total allegiance. Total. This is not Bible Belt Christianity here in Matthew chapter four. They gave Jesus their total allegiance. That is the decisive act of a true follower of Jesus. The decisive act of a true follower of Jesus is not half-hearted allegiance, not 90% allegiance. The decisive act of a true follower of Jesus is total allegiance. All the chips are in. Nothing held back, completely turning, total allegiance. Immediately, the Bible says, they left. They left everything that had been important to them up to that time. See, you need to know this today. Because some of you, you're fans of Jesus, but you're not followers of Jesus. And I'm glad you're not, because so far, you've not been willing to pay the cost because there is a cost to following Jesus. And not everybody is willing to pay that cost. They will live for their own life and Jesus says, that's the surefire way to lose it. There's a cost to following Jesus. What we once thought was of utmost importance is no longer important. A plan that we had, a dream that we had pursued, something that we had trained for for so long and given ourselves to, something that we had invested so deeply in, something that everybody in the family expected of us. All that's so important, and Jesus may be saying to you today, follow me, because I have a different plan. 
I have a different path. Parents, we need to think about that today. Because Jesus' plan for our children may not be what we've planned for our children. Like those fishermen, maybe Jesus is calling you today away from the family business. Maybe today he's calling you away from familiar places. Maybe today he's calling you away from familiar people. Or maybe today Jesus is calling you to look at the family business differently. Maybe he's calling you today to look at the familiar people differently. Maybe he's inviting you today to look at the familiar places differently today. Let me ask you, what would it look like if a person that was totally in total allegiance to Jesus, full-on devoted follower, through and through citizen of the kingdom of heaven, what would it look like today if they showed up at your work tomorrow? What would it look like if they sat in your class at school tomorrow? What would it look like if they played on your team tomorrow? What would it look like if they ran your business tomorrow, held your position tomorrow? What would it look like if they attended your church next Sunday? What would it look like if they lived in your house? Well, guess what? That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to do all of that in you. His presence, his kingdom in you. He wants to do that in you and with you. He is saying to you this morning, I want to come to your neighborhood. And I want to walk your streets. And I want to shop in your stores. And I want to eat in your house. And I want to kick it around your fireplace and your fire pits. He says, it doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter. Hurting. Or somebody that's hurt others. Broken. Or one who's caused brokenness one who just happened to trip and fall into sin or one who's been embracing sin with everything they got, Jesus saying it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or what's been done to you because I'm coming. From Zebulun to Naphtali to the here and now to you and to me, he's coming. And what is he one of us today? What could you do today to please the heart of God? Jesus just said it. Repent and follow me. You want to know what God's will is for your life? That's it. Repent, follow him. And for some of you today, that means that would be the very first time that that's ever happened in your life. That today's the day that you turn and Jesus becomes Lord and Savior. Funny thing is, the older I get, the longer I know the Lord, the more I realize I need to repent and follow Roger more and more and more than I ever have. It's crazy. I thought as I got older, like, I'd have that down by now. I washed all my windows at the house the other day, inside and out. Man, they needed it. I'm so proud. Looks so much better. Until the other day, the sun was shining through my bedroom windows at just the right angle. And it was devastating. <laughs> they needed to be done again. I, th I really didn't do a good job to start with, I guess. Y'all know have y'all been there with windows? You done that? There's a weird thing with windows, man. And maybe here today, you've been walking with Jesus for some time and you thought, hey, it's all good. Funny thing is, though, the closer you get to his light, the more it exposes. No, it's not all good. And so there's a lot of us in this room today that I think we need to hear Jesus say again to us, repent, follow me, repent. Man, if that happened today, all across this room, chair to chair, neighborhood to neighborhood, 
street to street, store to store, home to home, from fire pit to fire pit, we would see the kingdom of heaven on earth. So God, make it be. May it be so. We are so tired of the darkness and the brokenness and the chaos and the confusion. We need a king. And his kingdom and all that comes with it. We need you, Jesus, in our lives. With your head bowed, maybe you're here today. And I'm asking you, are you broken? Are you broken today? It's okay, because Jesus has come for you. Are you hurting today? I am. I cried my eyes out in the first service. I can't cry no more for y'all. I got nothing left. Some of you are right there. Hey, good news for us. He's come for us. Are you hopeless today? You're the point of giving up. He's come for you. He's coming to your neighborhood. Are you in that dark valley, that hard place today? He's coming for you. Or maybe you're here today and you're an awful sinner. You're here just hoping you can get out of here without anybody knowing who you really are and you're under that condemnation and that shame and that guilt and I'm telling you today, Jesus is coming for you. He wants to walk with you into your neighborhood. He wants to walk with you down your streets. He wants to shop alongside you in those stores. He wants to eat with you at your house. He wants to sit with you around your fire pit. He's come. And his kingdom has come with him. Holy Spirit, this place, these people, this moment, all before you right now. May we not grieve you. May we not quench you. May we follow you now as you guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, I want to invite you to stand and let's worship the Lord. I didn't say let's sing a song. I didn't say let's sing a song. I didn't say leave the building. I said let's worship the Lord. Let's not be religious and just say it's done. We made another Sunday. We feel good about ourselves. We checked the box. No, this is an opportunity, unlike any other opportunity in our week, that we're gathered with the body of Christ, God's church that he redeemed by his blood. We're in his very presence. He's spoken to us today out of his perfect word. He desires so much to step into our lives along with us, calling us to total allegiance, to repent and to follow him. Let us not squander the next five minutes, church. Too old for squandering. Let's press in, come on. Let's listen to him. Let's repent and let's follow him.